Greetings, energetic viewers, and welcome to Healthy Living. Today on our show, we are honored to introduce the esteemed T. Colin Campbell, Ph.D., a pioneer of nutritional research, a professor emeritus of nutritional biochemistry at Cornell University in the United States, Dr. Campbell has spent over 40 years researching, teaching, and developing diets to optimize nutrition and health. Dr. Campbell received his master's degree and Ph.D. from Cornell and served as a research associate at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT. He has served on several grant review panels of multiple funding agencies, lectured extensively, and has authored more than 300 research papers. His original research, both in laboratory experiments and in large-scale human studies, has brought him recognition as recipients of several awards, both in research and citizenship. Dr. Campbell is also the project director of the China Oxford Cornell Diet and Health Project, which eventually became known as the China Study, considered the most comprehensive study on the role of diet, disease, and health to have ever been conducted. In 2004, he and his son Tom co-authored the book, The China Study, which summarized his career's worth of research on nutrition, which concludes that a pure vegan diet is the most optimal for health. Dr. Campbell continues to actively participate in the development of national and international nutrition policy. My personal beginning uh, was from a dairy farm. I was milking cows, typical American boy, I suppose. and. Um, I sort of superficially thought the American diet was the best diet there was. Uh, and then I went to graduate school at Cornell University and did my doctoral dissertation along those same lines. Uh, in many ways, uh, it was a dissertation research that was intended to promote the consumption of animal-based foods, dairy, meat, eggs, milk. And uh, it was specifically focused on protein. In, the early 60s, middle 60s, I had an opportunity to work in the Philippines with uh, a rather distinguished man uh, who had been in the business a long time in nutrition. Um, and so he and I were in the Philippines arranging for setting up a nationwide program for, of feeding malnourished children. And in those days, uh, the view was that these children who were malnourished in poor countries are, nutritionally speaking, either deficient in one of two things. Either they don't get enough calories or they don't get enough protein. I learned, uh, actually, on the golf course, playing golf one day, uh, from my uh, Philippine counterpart, a medical doctor, that children who are age four and under sometimes were susceptible to getting liver cancer which was very unusual because liver cancer tends to occur in middle to older age people. And I started asking around and learned that these children who were likely getting liver cancer were from families who were the quote unquote best fed. They were consuming the most protein. Typical Western diet, they were the richer families. At about this time, Dr. Campbell found a study from India also showing a connection between consuming higher levels of animal proteins and liver cancer. When he returned to the United States, he obtained funding from the National Institutes of Health for a 27-year study that focused on the correlation between protein consumption and cancer development. We also did some work to show the protein we were using was animal-based. It was the main protein of cow's milk, and that made it really kind of tricky and kind of difficult for me. I'm coming from the dairy farm, right, right. and here the protein of cow's milk is a problem. Uh, so then we compared it with a couple of plant proteins. Plant proteins didn't do that. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden it was pointing a way to animal-based pro protein could be a problem, but maybe plant protein would not be. First, I should tell you what the China study is. Um, the Chinese in the 1970s had established that cancer was very common in some areas of China and not in others. There were big differences. And so they surveyed uh, how much cancer existed for about two dozen different kinds of cancers uh, all across China. They published those results in the early 1980s. And so because of these big differences, and also because the people in these different regions tended to live in the same places most of their lives, mm -hmm. it was a perfect setting to do a study, to go there and find out what was it that accounted for these really very different rates. And so we organized a study 
uh, with joint funding from China, the United States, and Great Britain, and Cornell University, University of Oxford, and two Chinese government academies were the lead institutions. And so we, we did this study to measure as many things as we could because at that time I had certain preconceived notions about what might be causing cancer. I had been working in the field for at least 20 years before that. Mm -hmm. And uh, one that I had was that cancer was the result of the multiple factors in food kind of working together. And the second view that I had come to know was that animal protein, when it was tested experimentally, actually can enhance the growth of cancer. And so those two ideas, the multiplicity of effects together with the idea that animal protein, maybe animal foods, were a problem. So we set the study up to measure as many things we could. Collected blood samples, urine samples, food samples, asked questions, and then just amassed a really large amount of information. And from that data set, then we could go back and sort of evaluate, investigate, analyze what this information was telling us. And uh, it was quite remarkable because in that area of China, mostly rural China, uh, they don't eat much in the way of animal-based foods. And so I didn't really expect to see much effect, to be honest about it. But in fact, when you started looking at this mountains and mountains of data, it became quite clear to me that even the introduction of reasonably small amounts of animal food in the diet began to create problems, mm -hmm. not just for cancer, but also for heart disease and other diseases. And that coincided with what we had been learning in the laboratory. The team gathered information from residents of 130 villages where protein from animal products ranged from 0% to 20%, with the average being 10%, a much smaller percentage than in the U.S., where the average person gets 75% of their protein from animal products. And yet, even at these smaller percentages, they could identify a correlation between consuming more animal-based foods and higher rates of cancer and other deadly diseases. And so what we found was that as soon as people start to go from the counties where there's no animal-based foods up to the level where there is some, mm -hmm. that's when you start to see blood cholesterol levels come up. You start to see cancer start to appear mm -hmm. and increase, start to see heart disease more. Mm -hmm. You start to see the kind of diseases we see in the West. And that was really quite striking. That observation, though, from the China study, it, standing alone, mm -hmm. just standing alone, in a scientific sense, doesn't necessarily uh, say a lot. I mean, it certainly suggests it. But what made that study, and what made that observation important was when you compare it with our laboratory work, when you compare it with the work of other people, mm -hmm. you know, other kinds of studies, then it becomes really significant. What evidence is there that a whole food, plant-based diet can actually reverse chronic disease? Well, we had acquired information that uh, using certain kinds of nutrients characteristic of animal or plant food, that we could actually reverse cancer or at least control it in an experimental setting. Uh, then I came to know Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, Jr. at the Cleveland Clinic, who uh, had done something very similar with people. And now he's published a book himself uh, just in February on reversing heart disease. And what he was able to achieve was something truly remarkable. He was taking seriously ill people with heart disease and actually just bringing the disease under control. He actually calls it cure. And what he, what he ended up doing was very similar to another man by the name of Dr. Dean Ornish. Yes. Uh, the evidence now shows that we can reverse or at least control heart disease. There's quite a lot of evidence now beginning to emerge that we can control even cancer. Experimentally, we could do that. We got to a point where we could turn on and turn off cancer development just by giving animal protein, for example, or taking it away or replacing it with plant protein. It's quite remarkable. Amazing. We do have some human studies now from other laboratories, other, other researchers who are uh, basically demonstrating that uh, cancer can be controlled to some extent. His extensive studies brought about Dr. Campbell's conclusion that an animal-free diet would be most beneficial to our well-being. I've just come to a, a very different worldview. Uh, it's a worldview that is based on holistic ideas. And uh, so I finally got to the place where I was saying that the closer we get to a plant-based diet, 
you know, the healthier we're going to be. Do we really need a lot of protein in our diet? And does a vegetarian diet provide all the vital nutrients that our bodies require? What we're now seeing, at least what my research is showing, is that excessive amounts of protein, if we start consuming protein in excess of what we need, cholesterol levels in our blood starts to rise. Atherogenic uh, lesions that lead to heart disease starts to increase. We get an acidity that then pulls calcium from the bones. We, we, get, we start growing cancers. And so the question is, we can't consume excess protein. The question then becomes, what's excess? Well, the amount of protein we need is about 8 to 10 percent of total calories. Most of us, 95 percent of us in our society, consume somewhere in considerably excess of that. We consume between about 11 and 25 percent or so. And so we put ourselves at risk by doing that. And uh, plant-based foods, a good plant-based diet, vegetables, fruits, grains, has just about 8 to 10 percent protein. It's, it's, I mean, nature almost made it so that it was ideal. A key finding in both the China Project and Dr. Campbell's research is that excess animal protein is a potent trigger for cancer growth and other diseases. In addition, in the case of breast cancer, he recognizes the role of excess estrogen, which also arises from animal proteins and milk in particular. Well, what are the factors that lead to breast cancer, and how can a plant-based diet reduce those risks? Breast cancer is, uh, like other cancers and other diseases, very complex from a biological perspective. And unfortunately, over the years, we've studied that uh, various factors that might be related in isolation. So we've learned some things. You know, and, and, but uh, it's quite controversial and debatable if people focus on these individual studies and individual entities. When, however, you put all this together in a more holistic kind of interpretation and look at things collectively, it becomes quite clear to me the breast cancer is a disease of the West. Uh, that's been noted by many people. Breast cancer begins to emerge as we start consuming more animal-based foods, especially dairy. Dairy food uh, has cer certain characteristics with it that uh, when especially young people, in this case uh, young girls, are consuming dairy, for example, to hopefully to get stronger bones and teeth and grow faster, as the ads have indicated, they actually then reach age at menarche or reproductive lives earlier. Boys, I'm sure, do the same thing, but we know we have better data for girls. So they reach age at menarche earlier, their circulating estrogen levels are higher, they remain, remain high as long as they consume that kind of diet, they stop the reproductive life later, they have a longer period, more estrogen exposure, all in large measure related to the kind of diet they're consuming. So I would argue that now, uh, as far as food is concerned, uh, animal food is a problem, especially dairy food. I, I think we should just simply not be feeding dairy food to our young people and all older people either. Plant food also has a protective effect. We know the dietary fiber and certain other phytochemicals and things like this in plant foods. We know that they also tend to repress, you know, the growth of cancer or cells that would behave like breast cancer cells. So it means being a total vegan, essentially, you know, to really uh, get to the lowest possible risk for breast cancer. Dr. Campbell explains that the main reason modern physicians and society at large are unaware of the profound benefits of a plant-based diet is the tendency to study aspects of health in isolation. Science itself in medicine is focused on reducing things down to its, to its details and then attempting to take these details of individual chemicals or individual nutrients or individual diseases or individual something. I mean, they, they really focus, focus, focus. And that, to me, is not really what medicine should be. That's not health. Health, and particularly nutrition, is um, a condition that is very holistic, comprehensive effects. I, I'm a biochemist by training. And if you could sort of crawl in the side of the cell, which I feel like I, I can do from time to time, you start looking at all these reactions, and it's like a symphony. It's like a beautiful symphony. You know, countless things are coming together to actually create a kind of dynamic, a highly integrated dynamic that leads to health if we give it the right resources. If we give it the wrong resources, we don't. 
We don't get that. It's, it's, uh, it's really quite a beautiful story. Through extensive research, he has found that when the body is given the proper nutrients from a plant-based diet, it begins to naturally heal itself. He emphasizes the holistic approach in maintaining overall well-being. We got countless chemicals coming in from food and being synthesized and so forth that are playing a role in that system. I mean, it's beyond our comprehension. There's so many reactions, so many enzymes, so many this, so many. And what it turns out to be is that there's a synergy within that system. The body is able to control mm -hmm. that massively complex system. Mm -hmm. The body in its infinite wisdom can control that system if we give it the right resources. Right. And so that's almost the antithesis of science as we practice it, the antithesis of medicine. Right. Because they're always talking about, you know, one drug, one, one so forth and so on. Uh -huh. But it's the symphony, it's the harmony that exists in the cells that really started to impress me. And when you think of that way, okay, then you go outside of the cell. You know, you look at the whole organ, for example, or you look at a whole group of organs, you look at the whole body. And what you find is that with our hormonal system, especially what sends messages around, and the neural system, which sends messages around, what you find is that the whole body is marvelously uh, symphonic. It's harmony. Right. And that's really what it's all about. And, and our body can actually manage health and create health uh -huh. and even restore health in people who, who have disease. It can do this. All we need to do is, I think, stop focusing so much on the details, think about the whole, mm -hmm. and then make sure that we consume the right kind of food. And the body creates health on its own. Right, right. There's certain observations that I find really quite fascinating biologically. For one thing, advanced disease, mm -hmm. like heart disease, cancer, and so forth, it takes a long time to develop, but it's reversible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because th th then the question comes up, you know, maybe it's reversible already after it's been diagnosed. And I believe it's true. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one thing. The second observation I, I would suggest is that the plant-based diet, which prevents it from going forward in early stages, mm -hmm. is the same kind of diet that prevents it becoming more serious in the late stages. So all of a sudden, this plant-based diet idea has more has more to do than just trying to prevent cancer or prevent heart disease. Now, we know it can be used to restore health. It can be used to treat treat people with disease. That's very exciting. So, it's a very different view than what we now have in medicine. Right. Right. You know. So, uh, you know, that's one thing. Another conclusion Dr. Campbell has reached is that by eating a healthy, nutrient-dense, plant-based diet, we can actually overcome or avoid our genetic tendencies. This concept is supported by the joint work of medical clinician Dean Ornish, MD, and visionary scientist and genome expert J. Craig Venter, PhD, who found that gene expression can be altered through lifestyle changes, including a diet very high in plant-based foods. Another observation that we worked on for a long time was that disease does not occur uh, just because of the genes we have. Right, you know, that's, genetic that's background. the reaction that I usually get from people. Like, oh, you know, my mom has breast cancer, I'm probably going to get it. Or, that's not, uh, like that. I mean, genes do play some role. It, it, here's the way it is. All these biological reactions whether they're normal physiological or whether they're pathological, all these reactions begin, biochemically speaking, they begin with genes. Mm -hmm. right. But eat there, and we have, you know, about 25,000 genes in all kinds of combinations. It's an enormously complex system. Right, right. And, and, they, and these genes all work together. So everything starts with genes. And in a biochemical sense, these genes, DNA in this case, uh, if you will, they produce uh, what we call RNA, the RNA then produces protein, mm -hmm. and the protein becomes the enzymes. Right. So, and then the enzymes is what's creating and controlling, you know, the events that subsequently turn into either health or disease. Mm -hmm. So we start with genes. Everything starts with genes. And, uh, but, and also we have some genes, all of us have some genes that aren't so good. Right. And they'll take they us down the wrong path. The, the question is, do, do, does our disease occur because of the genetic background, mm. very little or none. 
because even if we have some troublesome genes, either from our background or from genes that have been corrupted during our lifetimes, if we have these kind of genes that can give rise to some disease, we can control the expression of these genes. That means we can control whether or not they do produce RNA, whether they do produce protein, or whether they do produce uh, enzymes. Well, of course. So you know, even though the thing starts the genes, and that's a popular understanding, that's not what determines disease. What determines disease is the control of that genetic expression to give mm -hmm. you know, health or disease at the other end. Right. That's a very exciting concept because that what that means is instead of, I mean, if we rely on the idea that genetics causes disease, that's a very fatalistic idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we rely in, instead on the idea that we control the expression of these diseases through nutrition, mm -hmm. that's where nutrition comes into play. Mm -hmm. If we can do it through nutrition, that's a very hopeful sign. Right, right. We can do it for ourselves. And now we know what kind of nutrition it is. Right. So, uh, I, I'm getting very excited about, you know, a very different worldview. Ensuring that people have adequate access to health care is an important foundation for the prosperity and well-being of a country, company, institution, town, or family. In the United States, where people receive health insurance through their employer, this benefit has become extremely expensive for corporations to continue to offer, and many now are no longer providing coverage to their employees. Dr. Campbell believes the widespread adoption of a vegan diet to be the most effective way to lower health care costs. Even though it's been now three and a half years since our book came out, all of a sudden now things might begin to change in this way. The cost of health care in this country right. is serious. Yes. And so what does that do? That That's causing jobs to be loose because, you know, the companies can't afford the health care. Mm -hmm. It's having an impact on school budgets. Then they got to cut programs. Right. And so, you know, a lot of people are now beginning to know this. I'm having some very interesting discussions with some very significant people in this country right now. Mm -hmm. All of them only talk about who's going to pay the bill. Is it going to be the insurance company? Is it going to be the individual? Really, none of them are talking about how to make people well. They talk about prevention a little bit. They'll use the word prevention, but that word prevention to me is very superficial. They often, you know, say, stop smoking. Well, of course, you stop smoking. Exercise. Put your seat belts on. You know, exercise. Eat a good diet. That's what they say, eat a good diet. No one knows what a good diet really is. Dr. Campbell has launched the T. Colin Campbell Foundation to provide information to medical professionals and individuals seeking a better understanding of the role the plant-based diet plays in maintaining the highest level of health. Through Cornell University, the foundation offers accredited online courses that expand on his book, The China Study. The coursework provides a basic understanding of nutrition and explains how certain diseases such as cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and obesity are the direct result of the consumption of animal-based and processed foods. The course also provides practical advice on implementing a healthful plant-based diet. Another exciting feature of the foundation is its online social network where many people who have successfully overcome deadly diseases through plant-based diets share their inspiring stories and experiences and provide support to an ever-growing community seeking to do the same. There's nothing else in medicine that comes close to this in my estimations. Uh, I've already had three physicians come up and tell me that you know they're, they're getting their patients to do this. One of them he just he's bought about 90 books and he gives them out to all his patients and so he asked him to fill out little forms what they think of it uh -huh. and the reaction was really impressive and so i'm really confident that this needs to be the future of medicine mm -hmm. it needs to be uh, broadcast and told to the public right. and someday it can save health care costs in addition to recommending a vegan diet for optimal health, Dr. Campbell recognizes that it is a critical component in reducing global warming. The United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization has stated in a report meat production for human consumption emits more greenhouse gases than all transportation sectors combined. The big environmental problems are related to the way we eat. Uh -huh. It's hugely related to the way we eat. Right. What, what have you learned about how the, the animal-based um, diet affect the environment, for example? In, in this case, I'm going to refer to some work of others. Um, recently, uh, there has been 
a suggestion made, I think, two or three years ago by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations okay. uh, that maybe about 20% uh, or so of all the greenhouse gases that are produced actually begin with livestock production. And that's kind of startled some people, 20%. That's, actually, it turns out to be much more significant than that now, according to recent information I have. Oh, there's updated And data. the reason this is really significant is because the greenhouse gases that are produced by livestock primarily are methane, mm -hmm. carbon compound. Dr. Campbell points out that although most efforts to reduce emissions have been focused on carbon dioxide, reducing methane would be more efficient in cooling the planet. Methane has 72 times higher global warming potential than CO2 over a 20-year time period. Thus, minimizing methane emissions would have a faster effect in curbing the effects of global warming. We are resting all of our arguments about greenhouse gases on CO2 production right. and the control of CO2 production. Governments around the world are saying, right. let's cut back on CO2 production. The problem with that is that even if we were to cut back CO2 production by, let's say, 20%, mm -hmm. which is huge and it's no, probably not possible in the next 10 years, even if we were to do that, right. we're not going to see much effect on the greenhouse gas business. Wow. Because the CO2 that's already up there, it takes about 75 years, according to the numbers I've heard, for half of it to disappear. So it would take a long time. Even if we were able to do the best we could do right now, mm -hmm. we've got a problem. Mm -hmm. That's the argument with CO2. Methane is different. Methane, instead of lasting, you know, taking 75 years for half of it to disappear, it only takes about eight or nine years. Wow. So, number one. Number That's two, exactly. methane has about 23 or 24 times the capacity on a molecular basis of absorbing energy, let's say, for every 25 unit change in CO2, mm -hmm. we only need one unit change in methane to create the same effect. So controlling wow. methane production is far more important. And I just had some information from my friends at the World Bank just recently that the new figures now indicate mm -hmm. that at least half of the greenhouse gases that are up there now, not, not the 15 or 20%, mm -hmm. at least half and maybe considerably more mm -hmm. are due to livestock production. And that is, that, that's ex extraordinary because then if you could cut back on livestock production, you don't get the methane, right. and therefore you begin to clean up the greenhouse gas problem far, far sooner mm -hmm. than you would the CO2. Mm -hmm. right. So it's another whole dimension for the environmental question. Right. There's other questions too. Soil erosion is a big problem with yeah. livestock production. Water contamination, again, is a big problem. Water consumption is a big problem. Big problem. Uh, livestock requires so much water to grow. Right, right. So it's many very serious environmental issues that right. can be controlled to a great extent by simply not eating livestock. Dr. Campbell explained his view on why humans began to eat meat in the first place. It seems to me we humans have a sense of superiority. Mm. You know, yes. over animals, or superiority over environmental issues, superiority over like nature. Species, yes, or somehow we're the lead. We're the lead actors, and uh, you know we can do what we want. And so it comes down to a question concerning morality. You know, and knowing our place in the world. You know, and we ought not to be where we are. Right. You know, it's time now to start recognizing that. There is more on this planet than human beings. Yes. We cannot um, abuse our power. We cannot we abuse our power. Yes. You're absolutely right. And so I, I think this story is huge. It's really huge and it has so many implications, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. you know, to help solve problems. Yeah.